Let us pray. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, you who are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Much has happened this week. Much happened last Sunday. Much more seemed to happen on Monday. And then, you know, General Conference got its whole kickoff. And in some ways, it's not all that different than that first day of Pentecost. A lot happened on that first day of Pentecost. Tongues of fire came swooping down or gently falling down on all of their heads. The Holy Spirit came through like the rush of a violent wind. Those gathered started speaking in different languages, and not only did they speak in different languages, but those who were listening heard God's word in their own language. The people around them decided that they were drunk, and Peter stood up and made it very clear, no, no, they're not drunk. It's only 9 o'clock in the morning. If it had been 9 o'clock in the evening, that'd be another story, but it's only 9 o'clock in the morning. That's not what's going on yet. A lot happened on that day of Pentecost, and if you keep reading the story, we heard that Peter got up and preached and said that there will be dreams dreamed and visions seen, and in time, people started coming forward to get baptized one after another after another. A lot happened when the Holy Spirit gets busy. As I've been reflecting this week, one of the things that has been coming to my mind is what I would call words of the Holy Spirit. And let me share you with you a few of those words. Brave. Thank you. Courageous, authentic, spiritual leader, support, I'm with you, I have your back. Words that I heard this week through emails, through personal contact, through notes, words that came from bishops, district superintendents, fellow clergy, and you. Words that were spoken, words of the Holy Spirit, um, because as I said, the Holy Spirit can get busy, and it got busy last Sunday. And you learned about it on Monday, because I had signed what's called a love letter to the United Methodist Church. From your, and I can't even get around all of these letters, but essentially from your gay, lesbian, straight, and so on, religious leaders. I can't say I really thought about what the response might be. And to be honest with you, when I was with you last Sunday morning, I hadn't decided that I was going to sign that letter. I found out about it Thursday evening. And when I found out about it Thursday evening, I was like, I don't have time to think about this. I'm taking the pop-up trailer out for the first time. Lori and I were going to take out the pop-up trailer for our first adventure Friday and Saturday. I was like, I don't have time to think about this. I've got a trailer to learn how to drive and set up and figure out how to handle dogs at a campground. <laughs> and it kept working, though, in the back of my mind. And I kept thinking, well, you know, there's some legwork that I should do before something like this. I didn't have time to do some of the conversations I felt needed done. And so I decided I wasn't going to sign. But perhaps, 
as one of my clergy asked me what changed my mind, I said, well, perhaps some combination of the Holy Spirit and my own preaching. That, to some extent, the challenge that I lifted up last Sunday, the challenge that comes from John Wesley to do no harm, to do good, and to stay in love with God, seemed like it had reached the point that the best way to continue living that out was to live that out as sharing more fully who I am with you, with my colleagues, with those I do ministry with. The Holy Spirit was busy. So I decided to have a couple phone conversations on Sunday afternoon, and I found out I had until 5 o'clock to make up my mind. I got home from worship at about 12.30 or 1, had some lunch, had to have a dog training session at 2 o'clock. So you can kind of see it was an awkward afternoon, but finally made the decision and made the call and sent the email with my signature. The Holy Spirit can do surprising and amazing things. The words of the Holy Spirit, like courageous and brave and spiritual leader, they're really challenges that the Holy Spirit gives to all of us to struggle with and to work through how are we called to live our lives of faith together in such a way that we build one another up, that we help each other stay in love with God, and to do all that, the good that we can out in the world. As I made this decision, I thought about two young men that came to my office several months ago, struggling with their sexuality, living in rather conservative homes and wanting some spiritual support as they were walking through that journey. And we had a good conversation, and I shared with them some of my understanding of God and God's love for each one of us and all of us being created in God's image. Gave them kind of a dated book to read, which I kind of felt bad about. But I find myself wondering, perhaps that whole conversation could have gone just a little deeper if I had shared a little more of my own personal experience with them. Those are the small differences that I see the Holy Spirit will keep working on in my ministry ahead, words of the Holy Spirit. But those aren't the only words of the Holy Spirit that I heard this week. There were, there's a lot of words of the Holy Spirit happening at General Conference. Maybe I'll just start a little bit with the words that come from Bishop Gregory Palmer. He was charged with giving the Episcopal address, and he was one powerful preacher for about 40, 45 minutes. And I'll share just a few excerpts of what he said. After he listed wonderful things that the United Methodist Church is doing, such as imagine no malaria, he says, I simply have seen too much of what we can do and be for one who has called us to himself and to the mission to turn around now. I refuse to give in to discouragement and despair because the work of becoming the church we can be, of truly embodying beloved community, is hard. I feel like going on to see what the end will be. He went on and shared, We are the church that sits at the intersection of both slash and both of creed and deed in every way. And then here, this shouldn't seem like a bold statement, but it was. He says, everyone here is a child of God, period. Any behavior to the contrary of that truth undermines the gospel and a choice to live beneath our privilege. And he challenged everyone there and to discover once again in words that he heard a lay person preach, that we must discover again the vocation of being full-time Christians, that it will take a full-time church to nurture full-time Christians who are increasing in faith, being confirmed in hope, and perfected in love. This trilogy of increase of faith, confirmation of hope, and perfection in love is for 
themselves and for the disciples of Jesus Christ yet to be the mission that awaits us and the world needs and what we yearn for. We have been called to this work and commissioned to do it with all that we have and with all that we are. The only unanswered question is, will we go? It's always up to our listening to the Spirit to see whether or not we will go. And I'd have to say the next day, Bishop Sally Dick definitely decided to go. Um, in the sermon she preached, she, um, she went for it. And I'm, I'm sorry I don't have a clip of it for you yet. It was just too hard to come up with a little clip to share. But this is what she had to say. She says, now as United Methodists, we have one category of humanity, one that we declare to be incompatible with Christian teaching. And she said, and when I read the gospel story, and it was a gospel story about sharing mercy, she says, all I can say is, that is upon reading this gospel story about mercy, all I can say is, that seems incompatible with Christian teaching. She goes, now I do not believe that LGBTQ people are any more sinful than I, but I know that not all of you think the same way, and I'm not here to argue with you. I just want you to consider this fact. We have one category of humanity that we declare to be incompatible with Christian teaching. She goes, what I want is for us to learn mercy and to not have to have anything declared as incompatible with Christian teaching in our church. And she said over and over again, may we therefore go and do mercy. The challenge to go and do mercy. The challenge to listen to the prompting of the Holy Spirit and to go and proclaim. That's the challenge we keep hearing over and over again at General Conference. And it was wonderful to hear a sixth grade girl from Indiana share exactly how she listens to the prompting of the Holy Spirit and goes. She talked about how she saw a video about the desperate need for clean water in Burkina Faso. We saw a picture of a well that was really just a mud pit. And this mud pit is where people get their drinking water from, their bathing water from. And she saw that video, and this sixth grade girl said, I instantly felt a responsibility to help the children there, like I was their older sister. And she shared this in front of all the delegates at General Conference, and she said, it's my heritage, but she, her heritage, she used those words in sixth grade. She, she knows she has a heritage, and that heritage is being United Methodist. And so she sent out to start raising funds for clean water wells. So she said she'd start babysitting and doing all sorts of things to raise money. She herself raised enough money for three water wells and inspired 13 others to be built. There's a young girl. Here's the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Go. And she just makes it happen. These words of the Holy Spirit. It's easy to keep the words out there, to put a protection between us and them, because whenever we let the Holy Spirit in, things are going to change. And maybe that's a little scary. I suspect maybe even Hannah at one point was like, oh, if I listen to the prompting of the Holy Spirit, I'm not going to be saving money for those cool shoes that I want. Instead, I'll be saving money for wells. But the prompting of the Holy Spirit calls us to love one another better, to love one another deeper, and to go places that God keeps calling us to go. And maybe that's the biggest frustration some of us are beginning to experience at General Conference is will there be room for the Holy Spirit to work? Because we keep watching how we play around with the rules and how there's little power plays to decide what really gets discussed on the floor of General Conference and what doesn't. 
and how there's a wall of fear between is it possible that we can all live together in the midst of our differences? Can we really honor the ministry that those in Africa feel called to do given their cultural setting? And can they embrace the ministry that we are called to do here in our setting? But right now there's too much fear and this thought that we all have to be under the exact same discipline, the exact same rules of the church. Many are beginning to say the Holy Spirit is calling us and we can't do otherwise. The Holy Spirit is calling us and we can't do otherwise than open up our church for Don and John to get married next Saturday. I heard a very earnest layman get up at conference and speak about the importance of the church in his life. And I understood where he was coming from, grateful for the church that baptized him and confirmed him and taught him about God, a place where he could go and be married. And right then I thought, well, that's nice for you but that right now the church denies some to come forward to get married. But luckily, the Holy Spirit is working because some of us are starting to say, no, the Holy Spirit says Don and John should come forth and get married. A pastor down in California heard rumor that there might be a mandatory sentence of a year of suspension for those who do marriages. She says, took a deep breath and says, well, I'll be up for four years if that really happens. <laughs> because when the Holy Spirit gets moving, things get busy. And you just can't say no any longer. How is the Holy Spirit moving in your life? How are those tongues of fire settling on your head? That rush of the violent wind, what is it saying to you about what you can do in your life so that you do no harm, so that you love all you can as often as you can, so that you stay in love with God? What is the Holy Spirit calling to you? Because you have just as much to do in your lives of ministry, to share God's love and grace as I do, or as these bishops who prophetically speak. I think about times when I've seen the movement of the Holy Spirit in the ministry of, of lay people. And sometimes it simply comes when someone stands up and says, I'm struggling with depression. And I'm struggling with the daughter who has special needs. And on the outside, it appears that their family is a, quote, perfect family. And yet she stands up and admits something like that. And suddenly other people hear it and identify and almost take a sigh of relief. Let's, oh my gosh, if Linda's struggling with that, I guess I'm not so different. Or another one who stands up and says, in my family, we struggle with the addiction of our son. Those are Holy Spirit moments because they take a deep breath and they say, how is God's Spirit calling me? It's not just for their own comfort. It's to bring strength to those around them as well. The Holy Spirit gets busy, but we have to cooperate. We have to cooperate. And so this morning, I challenge you to decide how are you called to cooperate with the Holy Spirit? How are you called from the depth of your being to say, come, Holy Spirit, come, disrupt my life. Show me another way to love. Challenge me to reach out to that one who I find myself scared of. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Who am I called to reconcile with? 
Who am I called to forgive? Who am I called to ask forgiveness from? Come, Holy Spirit, come. Who am I called to care for and talk to and reach out to? As I was leaving General Conference yesterday, waiting for the bus to go back to my hotel, and it was a long wait for the bus, 10, 15 minutes, and there was a young girl there, probably didn't have a hundred, not fully facultyed young person, you might say. She kept asking me question after question, and frankly was irritating because I was tired. <laughs> I was just tired. But I knew I had this badge that said I was from the United Methodist Church because all I wanted to do was bury my head in my iPhone and pretend I had so many important things to read. But the Holy Spirit kept saying, how are you called to give her attention when it's the last thing you want to do? That's the prompting of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So come, Holy Spirit, come, show us how we can do no harm. Come, Holy Spirit, come, show us how we can love. Come, Holy Spirit, come, show us how we can stay in love with you. Amen.